Uh, it's a great pleasure t to me to chair a, a meeting on the subject of Indonesia and its affairs since uh, I was lucky enough to have a, an appointment in our embassy in Jakarta as a junior official in the very dramatic years of the 60s when Sukarno fell and Suharto rose and ever since I've been fascinated by uh, by Indonesia and its, and its doings. Uh, former Prime Minister Keating famously said that no country was more important to Australia than Indonesia. And Prime Minister Gillard, now in New Delhi, uh, listing the countries of most importance to Australia, included Indonesia in her small list of about five or six. And Indonesia, indeed, is our great neighbour, very populous, a moderate Islamic country, economically very successful with a steady growth rate of about 6% a year and a lively democracy. And, of course, its president, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, is a widely respected statesman in the region as he's someone whose good opinion is widely sought, as we've just seen with the visits by our Prime Minister and Opposition Leader. And he's shown, for example, by uh, his response to the tragedy of the Bali bombing, just what a weighty and thoughtful leader he is. In a way, you could say that He's really the first normal president that Indonesia's ever had because both Sukarno and Suharto were extraordinary figures, though in very different ways. And later presidents, Habibi, Megawati and Abdurrahman Wahid were all unusual in their different ways. SBY has been a good friend to Australia but his term is bound to end the year after next, and despite its many successes, Indonesia is not without its stresses, tensions and dangers. So how should Australia interact with it, and what can we expect the next years to be like? Now in that regard, we couldn't do better than have as our guide Professor Greg Feely from the ANU, who really is one of Australia's most uh, highly respected and uh, eminent uh, students of, of Indonesia. So I think we can look forward to the next hour with great interest, and I'd ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Feely. Um, thank you very much, Jeff, for that introduction and also for the opportunity to speak to um, the AIIA. It's always a delight to come to this beautiful setting, particularly on a spring evening. Um, it's got to be um, one of the most uh, enjoyable places to speak. Um, and I'm particularly happy to be able to talk about recent Indonesian politics and Australia's relations with Indonesia. And as Jeff said, uh, Susila Bambangyuri Yono, who I'll refer to as just as SBY, as most people do, is coming to the end of his 10-year term. The Constitution requires him to stand down in 2014, which will be the end of his second five-year term. Even though there are two years to go, much of the political elite, and indeed the President himself, are preoccupied with the question of the succession. Uh, and indeed, it's a constant distraction for the president and for the parties in his coalition uh, as these questions about who might replace him and how might the different political forces best manoeuvre themselves to take advantage of um, the presidential election that will be coming in 2014. So I'll be returning to the presidential election uh, a little later in the talk, but I want to first of all look a little bit at SBY himself because I think there's not that much known about the person in the West. In fact, I think, to my mind, he's the least understood of any of Indonesia's presidents. And that's partly because he reveals very little of himself. 
He's written several books. There's been several books ghostwritten about him as well, and none of them are particularly informative about what makes him tick. So, a little bit about his background and personality before discussing his legacy and then moving on to who might replace him. As for his background, he was the son of a moderately low-ranking military officer born in a, in a relatively small town in Java, rural Java. Like his father, he became a military officer, but in his case he was a very successful officer. He became the, the top student, the ducks of the military academy. Uh, it was also when he was at the military academy who he met his future wife. And there they are, SBY in the... Uh, This is at a, a rally for the President's Party, the Democrat Party, which has these, this blue colour. And that's his wife, Arnie, uh, on your right, and his son, Ibas. And I'll be talking about both of those a little later on. But much with Sahato. In Sahato's case, he was a person from a, a humble background, and his big start in life came when he married um, the daughter of an aristocrat, and that was one of the things that accelerated his career. Much the same could be said of SBY. I mean, in his case, he was already had a very um, promising academic start, but it was his wife who gave him connections because she was the daughter of one of the most important generals in the early Sahato era, a general called Sawo Edi. Uh, so just some photos. Uh, this is uh, Ibu Ani. Um, her full name is interesting actually. Her full name is Christiani, but when he was first elected, people accused her of being a Christian. And so since that time, she's dropped the Christiani and is now just known as Ani, Ibu Ani. Here's a photo taken from her own biography where she's standing. This is in the compound of the family house, the family compound. Uh, this is in the backyard, and she's standing in front of a picture uh, of a statue of her father, someone who she greatly revered. So SBY married into one of the most powerful military families uh, in Indonesia. And I think understanding this family connection is very important, because it's not his own family, I think, which he is most concerned about. It's her family. And this is a picture of the larger family. Here is Ibu Ani's mother, the wife of Sawa Edi. She also lives in the family compound, and she also is very influential. Ibu uh, Ani is SBY's primary political advisor. They discuss all the major political decisions. She is a very smart political thinker, and in some ways a more natural politician than what her husband is. But the grandmother also, or SBY's mother-in-law, also intervenes in a lot of decisions uh, and is known to be very influential. And so when we're talking about SBY approaching the 2014 election and wanting to secure the interests of his family, it's not his family on, from Pachitan in, in Java, it's the Sawa Eddy family that he's really concerned about. That's where all the big connections are being made. Um, his personality, everyone says he's a decent man. I think the evidence on public record supports that. Very thoughtful, compassionate, but also self-absorbed. Another thing that marks him out is he's a relatively clean politician. Not something can be said for other members of his family, but he himself has never been proved to have been engaged in, in any major act of corruption, which would be highly unusual for an Indonesian president. The main criticism that is levelled at SBY, particularly during his first term, is that he is a vacillating president. He's very hesitant in taking decisions. So when he was re-elected in 2004 with an increased majority, he got 60% of the vote. Everyone thought he has a big mandate, he's in his final term, this will be the term when he throws caution to the wind and establishes, cements his historical record as a president of substantial achievement in Indonesia. And so they thought second term SBY will be much more bold in his decision making. Well, the reality is proved the opposite to that. If anything, SBY has become more cautious, uh, more reluctant to embrace um, dramatic reforms. Uh, 
And indeed, one can see a regal tendency in his presidential behaviour. He's become more remote from many of the political forces that surround him. Many of his ministers have never met him and certainly never had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him. There are just a handful of trusted ministers and personal staff, we might call them courtiers or gatekeepers, and those people control access to the president and they're the only people, apart from his own wife, with whom he will discuss really important policy matters. Cabinet meetings, a picture of cabinet meetings up the top, are extremely formal, dry affairs. There is no debate, there is very little discussion. SBY himself is nicknamed by some of his more, his younger, more irreverent ministers as the professor, not as a mark of his learning, but the fact that he lectures them at great length about topics. And so quite often the decisions will be made out of cabinet. SBY will bring to cabinet the decision that he and his inner circle have um, decided upon. So it's very much a court-like atmosphere in the palace. And SPY is particularly concerned to avoid any perturbation, any disruption or turbulence to his presidency. And so often when we find there are controversies, um, if I give you an example, one would be um, the videotape of Papuans being tortured by Special Forces soldiers a couple of years ago. SBY was very angry about this, but when you look carefully at the speeches he made, what made him angry was the disturbance that this had caused to the calm, uh, uh, equable disposition that he would prefer to adopt in public. So the fact that there is a video that's gone viral on YouTube that leads other world leaders to be asking him about human rights abuses, that causes him considerable anger. So it's the disturbance that's created by such controversies rather than the event themselves are often the things that he is responding to. So he wants to reign regally, supremely over this system and he wants to be um, revered by all in the community. He's remarkably thin-skinned to criticism. Every morning he and his wife sit down and read three or four of the major newspapers over breakfast and SBY, if there's criticism of him, this can often, often agitate him for the rest of the day, if it's severe criticism, for days on end. His personal staff have tried to stop this practice. They said, we'll just filter the news for you. You get on with running the country, but he can't let it go. And he gets very agitated whenever there's criticism um, in the media. So he's obsessed with his image. That's not unusual for a politician. The last thing to say about him is that he is driven by polls. Again, not unusual for a politician, but what's unusual in SBY's case is that quite often the specifics of his decision making will be dictated to by the polls. Let me give you an example. There was a particularly notorious case where a corrupt policeman um, was arrested by the Anti-Corruption Commission. The police in turn arrested two of the commissioners from the Anti-Corruption Commission on corruption charges themselves. So this became a kind of an impasse and attracted enormous press coverage in Indonesia. The President commissioned a poll on what the community thought. Everyone was calling on the President to intervene, to support the Anti-Corruption Commission to stop this police retaliatory action. So he got the survey data and the survey data showed that most people thought the Anti-Corruption Commissioners were innocent and that they shouldn't be prosecuted. By the same token, the polling, I can't remember all the details of this now, but the police chief that he should be prosecuted. So what did SBY do? He did exactly what the polling said. He couldn't make his mind up until such time as he had the polling in front of him and he said, yes, that's what I will do. So he's very much a poll-driven president. So all of these things seem rather negative about him, but I don't want to appear imbalanced. And in fact, um, he's had a very steady, he's a steady leader. He's had a very stabilizing effect upon Indonesian politics. He's a man of the middle. He doesn't like to get too far out of step with public opinion, quite obviously, but also he doesn't like to accumulate enemies, political enemies. 
So this means that he often diffuses problems before they become big problems that can have a destabilising effect. And it's also this steady-as-she-goes attitude has helped to give Indonesia some of the most impressive economic growth figures in the region. Current uh, growth rates are running at about 6.4%, I think. Inflation under 5%. Um, almost record... Well, for the last 20 years, almost record high levels of foreign reserves have been held. So on all sorts of economic fronts, Indonesia is doing very well. And no small part of that success is due to SBY. He hasn't been an innova economic innovator, but he also um, has helped to create this kind of predictable environment. So he deserves credit for that. Now one thing which, and this is slightly um, uh, contrary to what Jeff was saying, but foreign leaders are forever applauding SBY as a moderate democratic Muslim leader. And there are very few of those who they can applaud in the Muslim world at the moment. And I, in fact, want to criticise that image or that praise of him um, because often he is placed on a pedestal as a kind of beacon figure for the rest of the Muslim world. There are several problems with this. One of them is that much of the rest of the Muslim world doesn't really follow anything that Indonesia does or rate Indonesia very highly in Islamic terms. So there are always limits to how much influence Indonesia is going to have. But more particularly, I don't think it's true to say that he is an exemplary, moderate Muslim leader. And I have some examples that I'll show. I'm sorry the pictures are rather gruesome, but that's the reality. This is the case of... And I want to talk about what happens to religious minorities, and in particular, Muslim supposedly deviant minorities. Now, one of the most persecuted minorities in Indonesia, and it is often persecution, is the Ahmadiyya sect. Ahmadis regard themselves as Muslims, but the majority of Muslims don't regard the Ahmadis as Muslims. And so there is a, a big contestation, and there has been for decades in Indonesia, as to whether Ahmadis should be regarded as part of the Muslim community. In recent years, it's become very violent. And early last year, there was an attack on an Ahmadiyya um, house in a village. The police knew weeks in advance this attack was going to happen. You'll see in the um, first image, the people are gathering outside the village. The police made no attempt to stop them. They come to the house. You'll see this is large thuggish man here, police officer, unarmed, quite a big burly police officer, puts his hand out, no, don't go forward. The thug pushes past him and then proceeds to start attacking the Ahmadis, followed by all of his, the other people you'll see there with machetes and iron bars and all sorts of things. And they beat to death three Ahmadis. It was all filmed. You can look at it on YouTube if you have a strong stomach. It is profoundly disturbing image. And this image where the person is beaten to death, there's a policeman standing by watching it. When almost the person takes the last breath, the victim, the policeman comes in and says, that's enough. And so here is a clear failure of policing. So what did SBY and his ministers do? Well, SBY ordered inquiry and he eventually removed the police chief. That was a good thing. But his Minister of Justice said he didn't see there'd been any human rights abuses. Uh, the Religious Affairs Minister said that the Ahmadis had brought this on themselves because they shouldn't call themselves Muslims. Um, there was a trial, and the trial was a travesty. Um, there's a destroyed house for the Ahmadi house. Here are all the people in court. There were uh, 12 people tried um, who got sentences from three to six months, which by the time the court case was held, meant they were released immediately. You can see how triumphant they are. The person who got the equal longer sentence was an Ahmadi who was trying to defend the house. He'd almost had his arm cut off. And again, on YouTube footage, for anyone who speaks Indonesian, you can see the judge basically grilling the person over their religious beliefs. Why don't you follow the normal Muslim practice? Very aggressively, the person was on trial for their religious beliefs not for any um, criminal offence. And so that person got the equal longest sentence um, for any of the perpetrators who killed three people. <coughs> we have another problem here with um, uh, the Shias. This is not quite as serious, but there is an attack 
several months ago in uh, East Java where two Shias were killed as they were trying to take their children to school. Again, the Religious Affairs Minister has said Shias are not Muslims. This is a very surprising attitude for a supposed Muslim academic to take, but nonetheless, repeatedly, government ministers are failing to uphold the rights of people who are Indonesian citizens and who also are adherents to religions that are not illegal, that are not banned. So they should have every right to protection and the state isn't doing it. SBY himself refuses to mention in any speech on religious tolerance the name of the Ahmadiyya or of the Shia. He says we must protect the rights of all, never any defence of particular groups. So he has helped to create an environment whereby sectarian vigilantes feel emboldened. And um, most of Indonesia, of course, does live in religious harmony. But if you are members of certain minority sects, you live in fear, in constant fear, and the Indonesian state has failed repeatedly to defend you, and SBY has failed repeatedly to defend you. And so I think it is wrong for world leaders, including our own, to repeatedly praise SBY on these grounds because he has a poor record. And in fact, religious tolerance has got worse, intolerance has got worse under him than it was under preceding presidents. Second thing I would say, um, uh, a major problem for SBY is democratic regression. Indonesia is often praised as a democratic state. In the last few years under SBY, his government has been complicit in various moves to undermine transparency and in to undermine the extent of democratisation in Indonesia. This is serial attempts to undermine the authority of the Anti-Corruption Commission, also attempts to wind back local elections. I um, haven't got time to go into the detail of that. And SBY is often quietly supportive of these efforts. Um, so um, there are some of these issues where I think he does have to stand to count. Talking about foreign policy, SBY's record is also mixed. As Jeffrey rightly said, he is a statesman. He speaks very well. He often speaks much better internationally than what he does to domestic audiences. And Indonesians are often very proud when they see their president at international fora. But Indonesia, to reverse a Gareth Evans statement, Indonesia punches way below its weight. For its size as the largest Muslim nation in the world, as a member of the G20, as the most powerful nation in ASEAN, Indonesia should be having much more influence than what it does, but repeatedly Indonesia squanders opportunities to influence agendas, and that's often SBY's fault. Hardly anyone can remember any speech he's ever made at a G20 meeting. If we compare Indonesia with Turkey, for example, a far smaller country, smaller economy, Turkey is now, could now be said to in many ways be leading opinion in the Muslim world particularly under Prime Minister Erdogan, has been very successful. So Indonesia has been left far behind in its wake, um, even though Indonesia's economic prospects in the next few years would see it becoming one of the top ten most economically powerful countries in the world. Part of this is due to SBY's own take on foreign policy. He has an attitude, which he's talked about, which he says Indonesia wants a million friends and no enemies. When you have a policy like that, it's basically zero risk policy, lowest common denominator policy. And so we see this on issues where Indonesia perhaps should be taking a strong stand, it repeatedly fails to. Um, SBY has also offered himself as a kind of mediator in various global disputes. One of them is in the Middle East between Israel and Palestine. Um, the problem is Indonesia doesn't have diplomatic relations with Israel, so the Israelis very quickly rejected um, his effort. He's also offered himself as a mediator in the Korean Peninsula dispute, also summarily rejected, rebuffed on that. And so, in lots of ways, he squanders what political capital he could have. So even though Australians regard him very fondly, um, in actual fact, diplomatically, he hasn't done a great deal for Indonesia. It's still underperforming. But Australia itself has every reason to be grateful for SBY. He's been a remarkably accommodating president remarkably understanding of the missteps that successive Australian governments have made 
in dealing with Indonesia. And I would argue we treat Indonesia the worst of our big four Asian parties, uh, partners, um, because of these policy missteps. Policy missteps that are often born of an excessive focus upon domestic politics rather than how things and what Indonesia um, believes. We can mention all sorts of things here, such as boat people, marines in the Northern Territory, um, setting up bases on the Cocos and Keeling Islands, um, American bases if shifted from Diego Garcia, of course live cattle exports is one of the most notorious examples, all sorts of things that have been very badly handled by the Australians, of course we have the opposition which is talking about turning back the boats, although I don't mention it directly to the President of Indonesia. So. Um, on a lot of these issues, we could have expected an Indonesian president to have been hostile and constantly SBY's had a calming influence when there's been domestic criticism. Um, many diplomats in Jakarta say that in SBY is as good as it gets for Australia, and I think that's right. And I think once he is no longer president, Australian governments are going to be, have to be much more cognizant of what a hostile Indonesian president might be able to do um, to the bilateral relationship. So um, let me now quickly move on to um, SBY's. Um, well, just uh, so the people who got who killed three Ahmadis got six months jail. Um, the student who painted SBY on the side of a of a ox, um, that student was sentenced to 15 years in jail for insulting the president. Thankfully, it was overturned by the Supreme by the Constitutional Court and um, the person is now free. But it gives you an idea of the relative kinds of justice available in Indonesia. Um, so how's SBY doing at the moment? Well, he's, he had a very bad year last year where he was tarnished by some major corruption scandals in his party, not him personally, um, much of them to do with the party treasurer, Nazaruddin, and this was one of those cases where a whole Pandora's box was opened when one small corruption case was suddenly exposed as like pulling of the thread of a woolen jumper and all sorts of things unravelled and it turned out that there was this vast web of corruption linked to political parties including the president's own party and we had this soap opera surrounding this treasurer who fled abroad he was in various Skype, he would give Skype interviews to um, various uh, newspapers and TV programs while he was abroad revealing all sorts of damaging information. He eventually was captured in Colombia and brought back and he's now serving five years in jail. So this was a big scandal for SBY's party. It unleashed all kinds of internal tensions and as a result his popularity and the popularity of his party dropped dramatically, particularly for his party. His party had been the most popular party, popularity range from about 20 to 30 percent. It's now down around about 10 percent. Um, SBY himself still has figures that Julia Gillard would die for um, in the roundabout in the 40 level, 40% 40 range it, it bounces around not quite the 50% plus he used to have a few years ago but still pretty healthy, healthy what does this mean for the succession for who's going to replace him SBY's diminished stature and particularly the diminished popularity of his party means that he's much less able to anoint his successor than what he might have hoped for several years ago. And so what I want to do is just quickly move through what his options are and what he, his primary goal seems to be to protect his legacy and to protect his family. And more than anything else he would really like to have a family member in the presidency to do that. But it's not easy. He's got four options in the family. Um, He's grooming, actually that's not the best one, there it is. So he's grooming his youngest son, um, Eddie Bascoro, known as Ibas. And his youngest son is a nice chap, but he's no politician. In fact, he's an embarrassingly bad politician. Nonetheless, he's been made the Secretary General of the Democrat Party, and he's also the Chairman of the Parliamentary Fraction, even though he's barely made a, a speech in Parliament. Uh, he only has those positions because his dad is president. But it's clear to everyone he is not presidential material and he will not be presidential material for the foreseeable future. So um, that son is not going to go anywhere. 
The second son, Agus Yuriano, is a much more talented individual. Uh, he's an army officer. He's just finished a master's course in America, much like his father did. Uh, and people say that if he's promoted rapidly, which is quite possible, that he could be a presidential candidate, but not before 2019. So there's hope there, but not immediately. Uh, actually, I've got to go backwards. Next option is SBY's brother-in-law, uh, Promono uh, Ediso Awibowo, uh, who is now the army commander, three-star general, um, and that's not a bad start. He's got several problems. The first is that he is extraordinarily inarticulate. He can barely put a sentence together in public. He's apparently quite a successful military officer, but when it comes to explaining something in public, uh, it's just really bad. Um, so, he's also got no background at all in politics. No one knows him as a politician, as having been involved in political circles. He's not in any way a political general. So, um, he also looks like a very unlikely candidate. The fourth option is SBY's own wife, Ibuani. As I say, she has a very smart political brain. She set up the party that SBY leads. Um, she's quite the political operator. She knows how to network, how to get businessmen involved. Um, she understands power. But her ratings remain persistently low, just a few percent. People like her as the first lady, as the Ibu Nagara, but they don't see her as a presidential candidate. And there would be great risks in SBY in putting his beloved wife forward as a president, presidential candidate if she's going to get badly beaten. That would be humiliating. So she's off the list as well. So what can he do? One possibility is to go for a loyalist, like his coordinating minister for security and political affairs, Jocko Sianto, who's a former um, Air Force Marshal. Um, but he doesn't want the job. In some ways, that makes him ideal because just keep the seat warm for one term, obey phone calls from SBY, and everything will go smoothly for five years. But it's a problem that there's no attempt to try and groom him into the job or prepare the public for this, so he seems to be an outsider. So, we've got to look outside the family, and SBY himself probably has to look outside the family. So this brings us to the presidential race as it is now. And there are three front-running candidates. The first of them is Provola Subianto. Some of you will know him. He's got a very bad reputation, much of it deserved in the West. Uh, there he is uh, with his red beret on when he was part of the um, commander of the Special Forces. Um, and he is the leading candidate at the moment. Some polls have him above 30%. Uh, and he's cashed up. His family is very wealthy. He has a, he's by far the most interesting of the front runners at the moment. In the last presidential elections, whenever he gave public speeches, he was always interesting to listen to. He's quite an intellectual. He knows the world very well. He speaks four or five languages with reasonable fluency, uh, including English and Dutch and German and French. Um, and so he's a redoubtable figure. He also frightens the living daylights out of a lot of people. He has a, a badly blemished human rights record, um, and he's probably persona non grata in lots of countries. Could he enter Australia, or USA, Britain, for example, would be a big problem if President Prabowo was ruling Indonesia. I suspect countries would have to let him in. Next problem would be, what if there are mass protests? What if people are holding up signs and burning effigies? Prabowo the war criminal and all those sorts of things. He has a volatile temperament. In fact, he has a combustible temperament. At the last presidential elections, he had to be put on a yoga course, daily yoga courses, to calm him down. So it would be very interesting if I was one of his rivals in the next presidential election, I would goad him and just see how long it takes for the veins to pop out in his neck and for him to explode. Um, because he's quite a fearsome character. Even members of his family are scared of him. Um, so, um, so he is someone who's not to be written off. All of these three frontrunners, by the way, face major obstacles, and Prabowo is one of them. Older Indonesians remember some of the things that he did, and they don't want him as president. 
Many younger Indonesians, and they are now almost the majority of the voting population, don't know anything about his past in East Timor. They don't remember the way he kidnapped student activists in 1998 and kept them in a bunker out in the Kapusus headquarters and things like that. Some of those people, by the way, in this kind of Stockholm Syndrome case, they are now working for his party. It's one of the ways in which he tried to defuse the issue. So, this brings us to the next candidate, which is Megwati. Mega again. She's now second, round about somewhere in the high teens, the low 20s. People groan and say, oh, Mega again? Uh, not a very attractive option. She was a lacklustre president, but not a disreputable president, reasonably clean. Um, I don't think she's got great prospects. She has a very strong voter base, but limited ability to attract people beyond that. Um, and the negatives for her are very high in the polling. One critical thing, though, last election... Prabowo was her running mate. So the question now is, will Megawati withdraw from the race, not that she's formally in it, but will she say, I'm not going to stand, and deliver her party's votes, which are probably about 15 to 20%, to Prabowo? If she does that, he has enough votes for the nomination. He clears the threshold. If she doesn't, he won't be able to be nominated unless another big party comes behind him. And there's no sign that any of those parties are going to do that. So Prabowo may not even be able to be nominated unless he gets a big party to give him those block of votes that gets him above the threshold. So that's a big uncertainty for him and he's working very hard to cultivate Megawati. No one knows what she's going to do. I suspect it depends on the polls. If the polls don't have her above 20%, she doesn't want to go to certain defeat. So she may well then surrender her, her polls to Prabowo, her votes to Prabowo. The last one is Abu Rizal Bakri, and one of Indonesia's richest magnates, and also the chairman of Golkar, seen here in the very fetching Golkar yellow jacket. Um, he's very wealthy, influential, but he has a huge array of enemies. Um, he also is blamed for this huge mud lake, this volcano mud lake in East Java that some of you might have seen. Um, he's also seen as an extremely predatory economic, a, um, a businessman politician. So lots of other major magnates are willing to throw millions of dollars to stop him becoming president. He's also not Javanese. And if you're not Javanese, it's a very steep hill to climb to become president. And so chances are he won't make it either. All these three candidates are all in their 60s. Where is the young blood? Where are the new people... 13 years of, Indo of re reformation in Indonesia, 14 years, how come we've got no new blood? Well, one reason is that two of the people in the President's party who were seen as possible candidates, Anas of Aningrum and Andi Malarangeng, are both knocked out of the race because they are involved in a corruption scandal involving the Treasurer that I mentioned earlier on. They haven't been charged as yet, but they're their reputation in public is gone. It's a great pity because both of them are young, well-educated, got ideas. They would actually be very competent leaders for the future and their careers are really, insofar as one can say this, are really uh, destroyed. There's Anas kissing SBY's hand. Shows how powerful he is. Um, so, the bottom line here, and this is just about finished. I'm sorry, Jeff, I've gone a little bit over, is that this is a very open race and it's a mugs game to try and predict who's going to win. There's too much time that needs to elapse and there are too many variables in what could happen. So even in seasoned Indonesian political scientists and observers won't hazard a guess at the moment. It's one of the things that makes it fascinating to observe but hazardous to predict. Um, I'm not trying to just avoid a prediction um, but um, that's my call of this. One interesting thing is what happened in Jakarta. We have gubernatorial elections in Jakarta recently. We had five rather staid establishment candidates, none of whom excited the electorate, including the incumbent. Then from left field came this, uh, and I should have a photo of him up there, but I forgot to put it in, Mayor of Solo in Central Car, Jakarta, commonly known as Jokowi, and he blitzed the field. He was entirely different. He just tore up the rule book for Indonesian politics. This Obama-like figure, very spontaneous, casual, relaxed with people. And people were drawn to him because he was charismatic, he had ideas, he had an excellent track record as a mayor in Solo. And so he didn't never 
never even lived in Jakarta, and yet he succeeded in becoming the mayor. So people are looking at this as a possible example. The electorate wants change, they want a breath of fresh air, and so candidates like Jokowi, and there are a number of other possibilities in the Indonesian political firmament, may well have the opportunity to suddenly compete, contest in the elections, given that there are three rather unexciting or problematic candidates who are currently leading the field. Um, yeah, I can mention some names, so, but I think I'd better leave it there. Um, there are a number of other topics I could have talked about, but it wasn't really time, but I'm happy to answer questions on anything.